Operation Domination is underway. The ultimate game plan to dominate your NFL experience. With your hosts, Dan Maiden. You gotta be confident about your Achilles. Yeah, I mean, I got an Achilles. Chris Dowhouse. And Adam LaRue. Don't hope to win. Be great and dominant. All right, all right, all right. Welcome back in to another edition of Operation Domination, the Injury Inquiry Thursday night episode that we always do live on social media at FF Advice Network. We'll be dropping this episode on your favorite podcast app along on YouTube Friday mornings like we always do. Look, we got a laundry list to get through. It's week 10. Of course we do, but we got to get this right because guess what? The playoffs are only five weeks away. So help me introduce our guests. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. The number one medical expert in all of fantasy sports. The one, the only, Dr. Awesome. I feel like I should be jumping off the top rope when I hear your announcement. Like like walking down to the ring, pull myself I up to the top rope, I maybe jump to like a Jimmy screen. Superfly snook up slam. I don't know. <laughs> Spread eagle full all out like that. <laughs> That's how I feel. I- I'm glad I can hear you because um, your face is frozen in a very awkward position right now. Just, just so you know. If, <laughs> Not, if on you guys... Not on my screen. Not on my screen. It is on mine. Maybe it's not on the live stream. Who knows? I hope not. But it's although, kind of although, like some, some would say that any position of my face is awkward. So, <laughs> you know. Oh, I apologize to those listening on the podcast. But on the video, it's it's quite funny if his face is actually frozen <laughs> where it is right now. But I digress. We got to hop into this. Oh, that's better. Now you're unfrozen. Maybe it was just a graphic we just needed to drop. All right, Bri. So first things up, Dak Prescott, I don't think he has a hamstring left if I'm understanding reporting correctly. (laughs) Well, at his age, that's very possible. (laughs) What do you got there? I mean, they're saying several weeks, so it's at least a moderate, mild injury. Um, You know, that's not good news with a guy who's been in the league as long as Dak has. Not a not a particularly mobile quarterback at this point in his career compared to what he was maybe back in the day, uh, and maybe that's why he had this hamstring injury. But uh, right out of the gate, they're saying it's going to be several weeks. So you know, at least three to four is my guess. Um, have they had their buy yet? I, I don't know. Oh yeah, they had it already. So you know that. I mean, does it spell a trip to IR? Uh, possibly. We'll have to see. But. Yeah, I mean, the reports I was seeing was that they're, they're talking about surgery. Like, it, like it's definitely IR and it's probably season end. <laughs> it would take a lot. Like it, it takes a lot to pull the trigger on that type of procedure. I okay. mean, it has to be a very specific kind of tear in a very specific type or part of the muscle tissue and or muscular tendinous junction or the tendon itself. I mean, it takes – there's very few indications to fix that acutely. So it would have to be a very specific type of injury, which I find hard to believe – um, to be honest with you, it's not very common. So we'll, we'll see. All right. So maybe some hope for Dak Prescott. We'll find out. In the meantime, Cooper Rush is going to take over. And we talked a little bit about this on yesterday's show when we do our, our weekly preview at 930 on Wednesday nights live on our YouTube channel at Fantasy Football Advice Network. And what we talked about was that ECR is way too low on CD Lamb. Now we're going to talk about CD Lamb in a little bit. Because uh, there is some injury concerns with him, but assuming he's okay to go, Cooper Rush had no problem featuring C.D. Lamb two two years ago when and Dak Prescott missed five games, and Cooper Rush was getting him the ball pretty consistently. Was he getting the ball downfield? Not necessarily, but Dak hasn't been getting the ball down the field to C.D. Lamb this year either, for the most part. So. I don't think this really hurts CeeDee Lamb. I think he's still a top 12 wide receiver, assuming he's healthy and good to go, even with Cooper Rush uh, out there. Now, as far as Jake Ferguson goes, maybe Rico Dottle. I don't know if it gets a little bit shakier for them, 
Uh, Dottle, they might lean on him more, but we still have Ezekiel Elliott and Dalvin Cook to contend with. And Dottle's just a dude. I talked about that yesterday. I, I'm not really a big fan of his. Uh, I would say this, you know, as long as C.D. Lamb's out there, I think the target share for Ferguson is not trustworthy. Nobody in Jalen Tolbert, certainly not the new, newly acquired ridiculousness of Jonathan Mingo. Uh, so other than C.D. Lamb, I don't know how much I want to touch this Dallas team, but we can still take him as a top 12 wide receiver moving forward. Now we go to some other quarterbacks. Caleb Williams was dealing with an ankle issue at the end of the game last week. So what do you got on him? Uh, I mean, the injury itself doesn't seem like it's anything serious. The The big issue was why he was even in the game at that stage uh, with so little time left and them with an insurmountable deficit to overcome. And then he got hurt uh, as guys were rushing the quarterback. But uh, he was quoted as saying that it was mild. And then uh, as far as I know, he's actually been removed from the team's injury report. So it's, it looks like it's uh, kind of a nothing burger there. A good news from an injury standpoint, but whew, Shane Walter's got to go. Now, look, Caleb Williams himself did not play well. He left a lot of throws out there on the field against the Cardinals. There's, there's no doubt about it. But at the same time, the play calling was erratic, not in sync, doing him absolutely no favors either. Eberflus, Shane Waldron, you want to save Caleb Williams? You want to save this offense you made an investment in? They're going to have to go sometime soon. In the meantime, DeAndre Swift is really the only Chicago Bear I trust. I don't know how you can trust DJ Moore right now. I don't even trust anybody right now as far as you don't know where the targets are going or if they're even going to get completed anyway, even against a team like the Patriots. It doesn't even matter. So outside of DeAndre Swift, there's not so many Bears I want to try to plug into my lineup this week. Trevor Lawrence. Now, this one's been a little bit back and forth. Didn't think this was significant until later in the week here. So what do you got here? Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, you know, he finished the game last week, but at one point he was seen on the sideline being evaluated, went into the medical tent, uh, came back in, finished. And then some reports are like, oh, you know, he's got several treatment options on the table. And it sounded like they weren't ruling out surgery for whatever the injury is, which we don't exactly know, or at least I don't exactly know. Um, and he's been limited in practice, so he's not completely shut down. But yet they're saying that he's very unlikely to play this weekend. Looks like Mac Jones is going to get his first start uh, for the uh, for the Jaguars. Yeah, just in time to play against Brian Flores and that Minnesota Viking defense. So yeah, good, great, great, great position to put him in. Uh, look, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Brian Thomas. I think in a little bit too. Uh, he did he did gut it out last week though, so I think he's going to play. But he's still not close to one hundred percent. Outside of Evan Ingram, there is no 100% guy. And Ingram might get 10 targets. The Minnesota Vikings leave the middle of the field wide open. The nice thing about pivoting to a guy like Mac Jones, even though no, it wasn't great the last time we saw him out there playing, is that this is a guy who has some talent, who was a first-round pick, and did, does, does have some starts under his belt. So this isn't going to be a monumental downgrade from Trevor Lawrence to Mac Jones. If you're planning on playing Evan Ingram, he is still going to be a top six tight end to me. Brian Thomas is still going to be flirting with a low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three, especially in a matchup with the Minnesota Vikings where all you can really do to move the ball is throw it. Uh, so that's the good news there, but everything else, I, I'm not looking for any other value anywhere else. I'm not looking for value in Mac Jones. Hey, Brian, I wish I had some trumpet music for this. CMC looks like he's going to return. There we go. It's beautiful. That, that Absolutely pretty much beautiful. sums it up right there. I think that's, that's all I need to say. <laughs> I mean, so he's finally officially entered the 21-day window to get placed back on the active roster and return from these, and I plural, Achilles issues. Uh, which have basically kept him out all season. Um, I don't think he's going to need much time. I'm sure he's been doing extensive rehab. You know, he's a very in-shape guy to begin with. He's always never skipped a beat in that regard. So, I mean, he could be ready this weekend. It sounds like it's all systems go. I mean, Kyle, now, we don't know what his workload is going to be. And uh, I think we're ta I talked about this after the show, post show, and you know me, and Chris, Adam, the guys, we kind of hang out after the show, and I, I almost feel like we should do a, an episode just on what we talk about after the show because I think it's just as interesting <laughs> what we do on the show. Uh, but we were talking about like what what was going to be the expectation of Chris McCaffrey this weekend. Look, I don't think anybody can accurately predict it, but here's what, especially as a 49ers fan, what I think I know. I know Chris McCaffrey's going to play in red zone. I know Chris McCaffrey's going to play on third down in passing situations. And I know he's going to get at least 10 carries this upcoming game, which should be enough to make him a top 10 running back, quite frankly. Uh, so if you have Chris McCaffrey, I have 
No problems playing him. Maybe don't expect RB1 overall just yet. But we also have a situation where Shanahan tends not to be able to control himself when it comes to Christian McCaffrey either. So who knows? Uh, I will say, though, saw a picture of Christian McCaffrey and you talk about working out on his own. I don't know if I've ever seen his bicep so big. So he was definitely training. <laughs> There's no doubt that dude has spent a lot of time in the gym. No doubt. <laughs> All right, so moving on from that, now this game is going on now. Uh, so I'm going to skip the Chase Brown thing because we know he's active for the Thursday night game. Yeah. Zach Moss, though, with the neck issue. This yeah, looks yeah. like it could be kind of ugly. Yeah, well, they were saying earlier in the week that he's out indefinitely. It sounds like now he's going to be done for the season. And that was even more reason why you could have expected Chase Brown to suit up again this week, uh, tonight. Um, coupled with the fact that he had a bruised rib and he still played and had one of his best games all season with that injury. So, uh, you know, there was pretty much no doubt in anyone's mind. I don't think that Chase Brown was going to be a good to go tonight. Um, and he'll, this will only ramp up his, uh, usage. Well, yeah. So they, they make the trade for Cleo Herbert on Tuesday. Now I don't expect him to have a big impact. Again, we're recording this Thursday night. So if you're listening to this on Friday, I don't know the results of the game yet. We're going to be watching it closely to see, but I do think from training for Khalil Herbert, the things that Zach Taylor has commented on, I do think the ultimate goal is to make this a 60-40 split at some point. Now, that still favors Chase Brown. That still makes him a quality RB2. And with his explosiveness in certain matchups, maybe even a low in RB1 with upside. But I don't think he's going to be running away with with 30 plus touches every single week. I don't think that's the goal for a type like a Chase Brown either. So he can kind of keep that in mind. But I don't think the the... Now, presence of Cleo Herbert is going to make Chase Brown somebody you have to downgrade to a flex position like he was earlier with Zach Moss. That's not going to be the situation now moving forward for the rest of the season. Uh, let's skip over to Brian Robinson. He's still dealing with that hamstring. Missed last week. Sounded like he came back to practice a little bit, but what do you make of this? Yeah, well, he was almost good to go. It sounds like they actually was a last-minute scratch uh, during warm-ups uh, in the game last weekend against the Giants. So, um, you know, Eckler, being a veteran, filled in admirably. Uh, they didn't really miss much there, I don't think. And then, you know, limited action probably this week. It, it, it could be another true last-minute game-time decision here, depending on how he fares uh, the rest of the week of practice. Yeah, so I'll have to keep our eyes on that. In his absence, we did see Austin Eckler lead the backfield, but they actually turned it into a three-man committee. Now, we've seen Brian Robinson miss games earlier in the season, and what we saw there was Austin Eckler came in, and then they also kind of sprinkled in Jeremy McNichols. This week, it was Austin Eckler, Jeremy McNichols, and then Chris Rodriguez playing a significant amount of the workload. So, Eckler becomes a flex play if Brian Robinson is playing. Really, I should put it this way. Eckler's value doesn't change whether Brian Robinson's in or out of the lineup. He is a flex play either way because he gets the same workload regardless of which one's in the lineup there as far as the starter is concerned because McNichols and now Chris Rodriguez are going to get worked in enough in Brian Robinson's absence if that winds up being the case. If Brian Robinson's good to go, tough match against the Steelers, but you're still firing him up as an RB2. All right, so Bucky Irving, he's been having this toe issue. And look, I know he's been playing through it, but it's very strange that he like, is barely practicing at all <laughs> and playing through it. <laughs> uh, no, uh, not to me. That's actually, I mean, what, so when you have an injury like this, which now has kind of moved into the more chronic phase, it, it a lot of times there's no 100% recovery, no matter how much time you take off, unless you completely shut it down for the year. And their line of thinking here is probably, listen, this is where you're at. We have two options. We can kind of just, keep going as we're going and you can tough it out if you can do it all season and we'll address it in the off season, whether it be surgically or not. Um, or we shut it down and we treat this the way it needs to be treated in order to get you back to hundred percent. And in some cases, in, in a lot of cases, to be honest with these particular type of injuries, uh, guys will opt to kind of just play through it um, because it's not, it's not causing them to be, 50% of what they are, you know, he maybe is losing a step or two, but if he's at 85, 90% of what he normally is for most guys, that's good enough, man. Let's keep going. Let's just ride this out. I'll deal with it later. Um, you know, there's big money riding on this contract extensions, possibly riding on this. Uh, you know, maybe it's actually for the team uh, and for the good organization, who knows, but you know, there's a lot of things that go into that decision. A lot of it from the player themselves. So uh, I think this is going to be, where we see him or what we see him doing the rest of the way, unless he completely shuts it down. So here's the issue with that. So even if he's active, 
Bucky Irving was on a track to where he was maybe taking enough of the work and on his way to taking even more work from Rashad White to the point where we were about to start talking about him as a top 24 play. What this toe injury is doing is prohibiting him from being able to do that. Now they're going to sprinkle in a little bit more Sean Tucker. Rashad White's not going to necessarily go away because they're going to be careful about the workload that they put on Bucky Irving. So basically what you have a situation here with the Tampa Bay backfield is that both Bucky Irving and Rashad White, two weeks in a row now, I've ranked them back to back as high in RB3s. And I think that's kind of where they're going to wind up staying most weeks, frankly. Rashad White, of course, getting a little bit more of the pass catching role. And as far as which one pops, it's going to just depend on which one gets the score that week. And it's going to be anybody's guess because their usage inside the red zone has been 50 50. So it, it, it stints what we thought we might be getting down to Bucky Irving down the stretch with the way things had been trending. But right now, his value has been a flex. I don't think that's going to change either way moving forward. Now, this next player, this was ugly. This was just ugly, ugly, ugly. Chris Olave with a nasty hit, gets knocked out, has to get put to the hospital. Thankfully, he's okay. Now, to no surprise, he's not practicing. There is reports that he's going to be talking to specialists before deciding exactly maybe how much time he should miss. Brian, your expertise, what do you think that conversation is going to be like right now? Uh, that's going to be a conversation probably similar, maybe not to the same degree, but similar to what Tua to Vailoa had discussions with, with his uh, specialists, you know? Um, Alave's had a few concussions already in his career. He was coming back from a concussion when this injury happened. Uh, and this was a lot scarier looking. You know, he lost consciousness on the field. He was down for a while. Um, definitely much more significant than the one he had prior. So these have a cumulative effect. You've got to give the brain time to rest and heal and recover. And unfortunately, there's only one thing that can do that, and that's rest and time. And so the conversation is definitely centering around what the potential long-term health risks are if he continues to play or comes back too soon. And you know how that could affect his the longevity of his career and overall health so those are things that he has to weigh and consider and then with the input from the specialist and the team's medical you know staff um he'll have to come to a decision and the team will have to kind of come to a decision what they're willing to let him do and when they're letting going to let him do it but it's probably going to be several weeks before we even have an answer uh for that Yes, it's a real interesting situation. Now, I'm no medical doctor. That's why I bring you here. Uh, but just reading from a football perspective of what I do and applying it to like kind of what happened with the Tua situation, we knew pretty early on that Tua was going to get put on IR. We knew pretty quickly he was going to go on our, yeah. IR. It doesn't sound like from both the Alave camp and the Saints camp that they're itching to pull that trigger quite as quickly. I don't think, and there's been people have talked about this, I don't think this is going to cost them the rest of the season. I do think we are going to see Chris Olave back at some point this year. Now, that may change. Brian, to your point, you have to have conversations and see exactly what happens. But the way I'm reading this right now is that there's an intention of Chris Olave coming back at some point this season. I say this because there's people out there asking, should they drop Chris Olave from their fantasy lineups? Uh, no. You got to keep him on your bench because when he comes back, he's a great player with a great healthy tar or target share. And I don't think we're going to lose them the entire year. We just kind of have to. I don't think you should ever drop a player in this situation without knowing for certain what the plan is and without having the definitive answer coming directly from the player or the organization. Um, there is so much subjectivity involved when it comes to concussion management, symptom symptomatology and stuff. You just don't know. And like, like we said before, it, it all has to do with time. So I, I would never recommend dropping a player simply because they've had a concussion or they've had multiple concussions until you know definitively what the plan is. Uh, if you can stash them on an IR spot, if that's available, do it. If not, just hold on to them until you get a final answer. Yeah, 100%. And I think we'll get hopefully get some sort of idea before this weekend what the plan is going to be moving forward. Uh, Drake London was dealing with a hip issue, but he has been able to practice in at least in a limited capacity the past couple of days. Yeah, he scored a touchdown, then was seen on the sideline trying to work out a hip and was on the stationary bike. He ultimately did not return, but it was later reported uh, from the organization directly that he had a hip pointer, which is basically just kind of like a bruise or a contusion to the hip, uh, basically up by the pelvis of the, you know, where you're kind of like where your belt rests on your hip. So it's a very common thing to see in football contact sports. Not usually a huge deal. Most guys will get over it pretty quick. Um, I don't see this costing him any significant time. 
All right. He may be out there this week. If he is, you got to plug and play him because they got a great matchup against the Saints. Uh, CD Lamb. So we talked about this. We would get to this point. His shoulder, AC joint sprain. What do you make of what's going on with him right now so far this week? Yeah, I mean, he'll probably be limited at practice. He's definitely not going to do any contact heading into the weekend. Uh, depending on the severity here, you know, he could play through it if it's a mild sprain or even a moderate sprain, sometimes with just some extra padding and protective, uh, you know, additional padding over the, the AC joint there on top of the shoulder, you can play through it. Um, you know, as a receiver, yeah, it's going to affect him a little bit getting his hands up to make that grab. Um, but, you know, not being at the running back position, I think it gives him a little bit more of an advantage of playing through it. Uh, so uh, we'll have to see uh, as we get later into the week here. Uh, but he's probably going to have a questionable tag at the very least and probably be limited in practice. So it may be one of those game time decisions. Pay, pay attention in this case to beat reporters because they'll know probably quicker than anybody else. Yeah, I mean, look, we we watched Jordan Mason, a running back, play through this injury the last couple of weeks. Now, he wasn't nearly as effective, but as a wide receiver, he has a little bit more control on how badly he can hit, get hit at times or how many hits he wants to take uh, after catching the football, too. So, yeah, I expect to see CeeDee Lamb out there as well. Uh, A.J. Brown, so this was something that I thought we were going to be a little bit more concerned about. Now, I don't think so much with his knee issue. No, he's actually made a return to full practice today from what I read. And it sounds like he's going to be uh, cleared to go uh, full full tilt um, this weekend. Now, he did have an MRI, I believe, earlier in the week or maybe late last week that didn't reveal any significant damage, just some type of contusion-type injury, uh, which is the best-case scenario. So uh, I think we'll see him back. What's going on with uh, Buffalo and, and wrist injuries? Yeah, I don't All know. Right. <laughs> it's, it's weird. There's a lot of players with wrist injuries, and – so Amari Cooper is trying to get back from his. He missed last week. Keon Coleman suffered a wrist injury in that game. I don't think he's practiced so far this week. So what do you got on the two of these guys? Well, the funny thing is that those two guys had a wrist injury. And then one of their uh, defensive linemen, Dwayne Smoot, yeah. uh, injured his wrist too. And is uh -huh. having to undergo season ending surgery. So I guess luckily, or maybe not luckily, unluckily, uh, the, the Bills are dealing with multiple people with wrist injuries. Two of them could potentially be playing this weekend because neither of them need surgery. And it's really not clear as to how significant it is, what type of injury it is. Um, one was an uh, injury that occurred, it sounds like uh, Keon Coleman, when he landed on the ground, trying to brace himself after a tackle. Not exactly sure what Amari Cooper's mechanism of injury was, but anytime you have that brace for impact type fall, where you lay out on an, uh, or place your hands out in front of you with an outstretched arm, you always wonder or worry about more significant wrist injuries at that type of mechanism. Now, if you're talking about a direct impact or a direct hit, usually not as, as bad, which I have a feeling that's what Amari Cooper might have sustained. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but either way, both players are probably going to be questionable. They'll probably be somewhat limited in practice, and they could, again, be game-time decisions. They might be playing with it wrapped up, potentially, which could affect their ability to catch. So a couple of things to keep uh, your eye on. Yeah, for sure. And, and look, we'll find out more after the Friday practice reports. Make sure you're keeping your eyes peeled on that. But uh, from my understanding of the reporting going on, I don't think we're expecting to see Keon Coleman this week. Now, Mark Cooper does sound like he might be active. Either way, Khalil Shakir is a fine player, especially in full point PPR. This doesn't really boost his value. He has his role. His role is his role. He's going to get seven to nine targets regardless of who's out there. And you're hoping for, you know, get a 10 yards per catch kind of type of deal. And you get a decent fantasy day that way. If Amari Cooper's back, then it's been a few weeks now. At least mentally, he should be enthralled into the offense, even if he hasn't been necessarily practicing or wasn't able to play last week. But I expect to see Amari Cooper to start to get going here. And especially if there's no Keon Coleman, Cooper's somebody I'm going to want to have in my lineup this week if he is out there. Uh, T. Higgins, again, this game is already going on. We already know he's not going to uh, play in this game. He was ruled out. But with the quad issue, how much longer do you think this is going to linger? Uh, yeah. So, it's, I mean, I was actually, I wrote down it and I'll read it for you. You know, he was, a, the, he did not practice Monday, which traditionally is not a huge deal uh, because it's not a huge practice day traditionally, unless you play Thursday night, which the Bengals do, uh, then it's a big deal and it wasn't looking good. And lo and behold, he's not playing. So that's concerning for next week too now, although they do get the extra day or two of rest um, if they come back and play Sunday next week. Uh, but it, it sounds like it's a bigger deal than it should be. Most of the time, quad injuries are pretty uh, mild. It's, it's a very strong muscle group. It's not easily injured. Usually with contusions, what you see in football from a direct hit, you can get over that fairly quickly with no lingering issues. If it's a quad strain, different story. That takes a tremendous amount of force to cause injury to the quad. 
And if that's the case, the quad can take quite a while to heal. It's a huge muscle group, very important muscle group for movement, explosive movement, and type of activities. So um, certainly something we need to monitor heading into next week as well, but it could potentially spell another uh, DNP uh, next week if he's not able to get back on the practice field at least. Well, and it's not like the Bengals are ever forthright on anything that's going on with their players. Like who? Like yeah, everyone's day to day, everyone's week to week. It just it take anything Zach Taylor says and just throw it the hell out because he's constantly lying out of his mouth. Uh, Devonta Smith was dealing with a hamstring issue. Didn't practice on Wednesday. Did come back in a limited capacity here today. Are you at all worried about him this Sunday? Um, with AJ Brown coming back, it's probably not a big deal, and we'll probably see him. Uh, you know slowly ramp up some more practice activity this week, although being late in the, in the game here, um, I think we'll see him probably limited in practice, but he should be available. It didn't sound like it was a major injury or at least anything serious. He's a veteran. So I think they were just using this week to give him some more time to recover. Knowing that AJ Brown's coming back, I think they'll be okay with letting him start. But if that, if it does look like, or he does have any type of uh, symptoms still there, or has any type of uh, ill feelings, he, he could see some limited time depending on how that game unfolds. Yeah. Uh, so it, that was just something that was weird. It popped up. We didn't know about it during Sunday, but the fact that he's practicing limited capacity here on Thursday, I, I think he is, he might be good to go. Um, Darius Slate. Now he's actually, this just came on while we were recording this. He is already ruled out. He's not going to make the plane trip over to Germany. They went ahead and rolled him out with a concussion issue. And so we can go ahead concern. and, yeah. Yeah. So we can go ahead and just kind of skip over that one because we already know the answer yeah, well, to that. If it wasn't for that flight, if it wasn't for the transatlantic flight and playing in a different time zone, you know, completely messing up their schedule, I'm sure he might have had a chance to come back. But as soon as you, you remembered that they played in Munich, there was probably very little shot that he was going to be uh, making that trip. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's go to Xavier Leggett because he's been having a hand issue. And now, you know, there's still no Adam Thielen. There's no Deontay Johnson. I know Jalen Coker has been in the mix, but he's kind of been the wide receiver one here for, for the Carolina Panthers and somebody who's been a wide receiver four in my rankings. So what do you got with his hand issue? Yeah, this this shouldn't change any of that. Um, it sounds like it's nothing serious. He did go and get it looked at um, in the locker room at halftime, but then came back out in the third quarter and finished the game. He was quoted afterwards as telling reporters that it's a little sore, but otherwise he feels fine and Got no reason to doubt that we should see him full go. The Bucks can't catch a break with uh, keeping wide receivers on the field here, man. Uh, Jalen McMillan, hamstring. Yeah, he tweaked it in practice, apparently, last Friday, and then didn't play in their Monday night game. Um, with Mike Evans being out, Godwin gone for the year, now McMull McMullen, you know, uh, McMillan, I should say, nursing this hamstring injury, uh, that could spell problems getting it back on the field uh, this week too, you know, with the short turnaround. So uh, if, if he can't, and again, like I say this all the time, if he, they can't get a full practice in on a tweaked hamstring that cost them a game last weekend, I don't see how it's going to happen again. So we'll keep our eye on that. But look right now, Kate Otten is the only pass catching option that I want for the Tampa Bay Bucks. And they've done a great job featuring him. I and mean, he's had double digit targets every single week since Chris Godwin and Mike Evans have been out every single week. Uh, and he's been very productive in that. Um, but going against San Francisco 49ers, Baker Mayfield has been an elite quarterback. Well, with no weapons uh, going up against a tough defense, a tough pass defense, who's only given up the eighth most points to quarterbacks so far this season. I'm not playing Baker Mayfield. In fact, I have him ranked at quarterback 15 this week. He's going to be outside my top 12. I think there's better options that you can go ahead and pivot to. KDOT and I still play. KDOT and I still have my top five. It's hard to get tight ends with that kind of target share week in and week out. And I don't see why that would change even in a tough match against San Francisco. Maybe he's not going to put up the gaudy two touchdown, 100 yard performances, but I do think he's got a safe floor of 60 to 80 yards, potentially a touchdown. So I, I'm playing Kate Otten no matter what in that scenario because of the volume target share. Now, Brian, I don't know if you even know this because looking at your comment here, I'm not sure that you do, but I actually have good news about Dallas Goddard. He practiced in full. He looks like that. he's back. Well, there you go. Like I just got done saying, if you can get a full practice in and you get through that unscathed and you're feeling good, the chances of coming back are astronomically higher. And he's already missed three games with this hamstring issue. So four weeks, you know, that's an adequate amount of time, depending on the severity, of course. It sounds like it wasn't serious. If it was, he probably would have ended up on IR from the get-go. 
So um, that's a good step in the right direction. We'll see how he recovers from that first full practice back. Um, likely going to be a little sore. Wouldn't be shocked if he's a little bit limited on Friday, if he is, in fact, sore. But that well, doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be I'll out. do you one better, Brian. I'm looking at the Eagles site right now. He's not even listed on the injury report. Okay. So I think, and like I was just finished in saying, it doesn't <laughs> even if he was, I don't necessarily think that that means he's out. So um, that's great news. Uh, we should see him suit up and finally make his return. And it's just funny because we had this conversation last night during our, our weekly preview for week 10, talking about tight ends. Our tight ends back. Uh, they're finally get, they're, we finally have a group of tight ends that are getting a healthy target share. I talked about how I was cautiously optimistic about the notion that tight ends are just back. One, there are a handful of tight ends like Kate Otten, like Evan Ingram, where it's context. Christian Kirk got hurt. Kate Otten had saw Godwin and, and Mike Evans get hurt, and it led to a boost in target share. Um, and in Goddard's case, he's about to come back. TJ Hawkinson made his appearance last week. So I do think we're back to the point where we have six to eight tight ends. I think we actually want to play. And then we have a few streamers that we can kind of pick based off of matchup and, and context, depending upon what their target shares are looking like. It's not to what it was, or at least what we thought it was going to be in the beginning of the season, because in the beginning of the year, if you remember we thought we were actually going to have 12 tight ends to choose from and everybody was going to be happy with a tight end to play this year. And then it just went, psh, it was like, you had George Kittle and everything else sucked. But I do think we're back from that point at the very, at the very least. So uh, shout out there. Dallas Goddard back. Somebody who's in that low end tight end one tight end two territory, usually speaking week in and week out anyway. And this week, I mean, the entire Eagles offense might just go off against the Dallas Cowboys. So, I mean, just play anybody you pretty much got coming up in this week. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Brian, make sure you tell everybody where to check you out at. What you got coming up? Yeah, um, on X at Injured List Pod, Instagram, Facebook, the Injured List Podcast, the website, the Injured List.com. And of course, that sports podcast network and TSS Fantasy on Fridays and Sundays. And then up here every Thursday night with Dan and Operation Domination. Um, what do I got coming up? Well, I've got some cool stuff coming up, actually. I've got a, a new episode that I'm going to be releasing hopefully uh, next week sometime. And then on uh, November 13th, I'll be heading down to Greenville, South Carolina to do a very special recording um, with Green, Green, and I got to get this right, Green Gridiron. It's, uh, they do custom helmets, if I'm not mistaken. That's the, yeah, they're at the Fantasy Football Expo. Got to see some of their work. It was iron. They're incredible. called Green Gridiron. They, they're based out of uh, Greenville, South Carolina. They do some awesome, awesome stuff, customization with uh basically discarded used uh, professional football helmets, full-sized. So I'm going to be doing a live um, video with them uh, talking about the history of the football helmet, the safety features, and all kind of the design features and stuff and how it goes into it to help prevent against injuries to the head. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. I'm going to be driving down there doing that live in their studios, which is awesome. So I look forward to that, and hopefully I'll have that up um, not too long after we get done recording that um, for you guys to check out. Awesome. They're going to be surprising me with the helmet. I have no idea. I gave them some like, <laughs> I gave them some graphics. I gave them some color schemes and they're going to kind of whip something up off the top of their heads for me. I'm uh, kind of excited to see what they've put together. That's fantastic. Can't wait to see that one. They did some great work. We were all there at the Fantasy Football Expo. Uh, guys, make sure you come back next Wednesday at 930. We'll have the Week 11 preview for you here on Operation Domination. Always live on the Fantasy Football Advice Network on YouTube and download on your favorite podcast app. Everyone, good luck this weekend. Make sure you hit me up at Dan Mater FF if you have any fantasy football questions throughout the weekend, and we'll see you soon. Hey there, I want to thank you for watching Operation Domination today. And if you're enjoying the show, there are some ways you can help support us. You can go to podchaser.com slash Operation Domination and leave us a five-star review. And you can do this on any podcast platform or on our YouTube page when you go to at FF Advice Network. This completely helps out the show, be able to grow, and also leave us comments to let us know how we can curtail the show to you you are the most important member of the show. So again, go to podchaser.com slash Operation Domination to leave a five-star review and leave a comment wherever you listen or watch the show and we'll help better serve you.